Hello, my name is Sabina Sueta Senkutstavska. I work at the Institute of Culture Studies at the University of Silesia in Katowice. Before I proceed, I would like to thank and acknowledge Professor Eugenia Soika for initiating the idea for this lecture and preparing with me the title and abstract for this presentation. It aims at drawing your attention to indigenous knowledge and ways of being. I will share about the cultures and knowledge of people who have for a very long time been perceived through the stereotypical lenses imposed upon them by the colonial and Western world. Explorers, scholars, scientists, politicians. Indigenous people have been portrayed as marginalized, ancient, savage or exotic, starting with the very first mistaken identity, the Indian introduced by Columbus. Going far beyond these colonial frameworks, this presentation offers indigenous perspectives on their own culture and is fundamentally about the gift of knowledge that indigenous artists and scholars share with the entire world. I'll start this presentation on shaman artists, the artistic ceremonies of the indigenous artists from Canada with a brief introduction to shamanism how it is un understood by its practitioners, and then move to chosen visual and performative artworks of two indigenous artists to elaborate on how these indigenous shaman artists advocate on their cultures and philosophies in their artistic ceremonies and what role do they play in the contemporary world. Shamanism can refer to a range of different practices that are one of the oldest practices present within indigenous communities across the world. And while Mircea Eliade, a Romanian historian and specialist in religion studies, defined it as a technique of religious ecstasy, it is much deeper and more complex for those who have practiced it for centuries or time in memorial. The term shamanism was popularized by Western anthropologists and ethnographers who drew from their research on the practices they saw among the Tungus people in Siberia. The noun saman in Manchu Tungus is formed from the verb sa, to know. Thus a shaman literally means one who knows. If we look at the Inuit cultures, we will find terms that contain similar meanings such as wise, those who have eyes in the dark, one who has eyes, or a spirit that ena enables one to see. Seeing and knowing are the key notions, but it is not literally about seeing through the physical eyes. And cognition and knowledge are not understood here only as faculties of mind. Other indigenous cultures such as Haida, Tsimshin, and Ishinabe or Cree identify the figure of the medicine man or woman. These examples of words from different indigenous languages referring to the, these practices related to shamanism, besides seeing and knowing, also point to a, another key element that is the presence of the spirits. The shaman's ability to communicate with the spirit world, but also with the entire nature and the ability to treat illness and heal. Who are they and what is their role in their communities? The shamans can be women, men and transgender individuals of every age. Shamans are the most notable and highly revered figures present in indigenous cultures. They function as healers, prophets, diviners. Shaman prophets and diviners are concerned with predicting the outcomes of the hunt, relocating lost objects, and determining the root causes of the communal discontent and ill will. They are also storytellers and custodians of religious mythology and traditional ways of living, and are also often the officiants at religious ceremonies. In some societies, all these functions are performed by the same person, while in others, shamans may take on specific roles. But they all serve people and take great responsibility for their role. First and foremost, however, their practices demonstrate the holistic perspective and interrelations that are at the heart of indigenous epistemologies. 
As Joanne Archibald explains, I quote, an indigenous philosophical concept of holism refers to the interrelatedness between the intellectual, spiritual, emotional, and physical realms to form a whole healthy person. The image of a circle is used by many First Nation people to symbolize wholeness, completeness, and ultimately wellness. The never-ending circle also forms concentric circles to show both the synergistic influence of and our responsibility toward the generations of ancestors, the generations of today, and the generations yet to come. The animal human kingdoms, the elements of nature, land, and the spirit world are an integral part of the concentric circles. A common goal has been to attain a mutual balance and harmony among animals, people, elements of nature, and the spirit world. Thus, the shaman's primary role is to maintain this balanced relationship between the people and the natural world and the world of the sacred powers. So they are intermediaries between different worlds. They form this link, this connection, and occupy a liminal space. So let's now consider what is the relationship between art and shamanism, performance, art, and ceremony or ritual. Floyd Fagel, a Cree theatre theorist, director, teacher, essayist, and cultural leader, says that theatre is the younger brother of ritual. He says so to indicate that while there was no theatre practice within the indigenous cultures in the sense of the Western definition, there were rituals that shared features with theatre. Shaman's work involves using medicinal plants, having psychotropic substances and or other healing properties, magic making, but also rhythmic drumming, dancing, chanting, singing, storytelling, masking and costuming. And these are some of those shared theatrical, artistic, and ceremonial elements. The shaman uses certain sacred objects such as a drum, drumstick, headgear, gong, rattle, mirror, and stuff, where the materials and shapes of these objects have meaning. Artists I will refer to also use significant objects in their work. Richard Schechner, a performance scholar, states, I quote, instead of thinking of the oppositional binary, ritual or art, one should think of a spectrum or a dynamic braid. Performances both entertain and ritualize. The questions one ought to ask are to what degree does a performance entertain, give pleasure, is made so that it is beautiful, and to what degree is a performance efficacious, made in order to accomplish something, Please or appeal to the gods, mark or celebrate an important event or life milestone such as birth, puberty, marriage or death. Shekna Das uh, points to the efficacious nature of performance that may include in our case teaching, transformation, healing or bringing peace and order. An artist and a shaman seem to represent a beyond ordinary human who has mastered the technique of seeing, feeling, and expressing in a more than ordinary way, in a more extensive manner. Both of them go through transformative experiences, physical, spiritual, and cathartic. Who are then indigenous artist shamans? And what are their roles? What can we learn from them? How do they conduct their artistic ceremonies? And what message do they share? The first artist, Norval Morrison, from the Bingui Niyashi Anishinaabeg First Nation, who was a visual artist, painter, printmaker, and illustrator, known as Picasso of the North and the founder of the Woodland School of Canadian Art. As Picasso, he broke away from tradition and revolutionized indigenous arts, but most importantly, he was known as the shaman artist. Raised by his maternal grandparents, he was influenced by their Anishinaabe teachings, and especially his grandfather, who was a medicine man and knowledge keeper, a midewing. 
However, as a five years old child, he was forcefully taken from his family and placed at a residential school. These were institutions that functioned across Canada and the USA, mostly run by churches and financed by the Canadian government. They functioned from the 1880s till 1996, and they were set to literally erase indigenous languages, beliefs, traditions, and their way of life, and assimilate them into Canadian society. Children were not allowed to speak their native languages, wear their traditional attire, or practice their ceremonies. They were malnourished and underwent physical and psychological mistreatment and forced labor. Many children died, and those who survived have faced traumas which are still an ongoing experience referred to as multi-generational trauma. Being unable to form healthy families with drug and alcohol addictions and complex physical and mental illness, there are many indigenous people who continue to struggle with the long-term effects of this historical institution. Upon his return, art became a path for Morisot's own healing journey, but also one that offered teachings of his indigenous beliefs and traditions and healing for his own community and all other people. So his life experience informs his shamanistic journey. He was a self-taught artist drawing his technique and themes from his own indigenous ceremonies and ways of accessing knowledge, so dreams, trans, stories. Shamans are believed to be assisted by spirit beings, guardian spirits, animals, birds, or other beings, and these spirits are those who decide for one to become a shaman. So the one who is chosen, often an adolescent, may have dreams and visions that, of that spirit being. They may resist this calling, sometimes for years, but are tortured by the spirits, which make their lives very challenging, they might be going through physical or mental illness or other hardships. But ultimately, the person stops resisting and accepts the vocation. This, in some ways, could be compared to artists suppressing self-expression, which is also harmful to them. So trance and dreams and ceremonies are often the paths through which shamans are believed to be able to communicate directly with the spirits and undergo transformations. As an adolescent, Morisot fell sick with tuberculosis and underwent a naming ceremony led by the Midwin Society, where he was named Copper Thunderbird, a powerful spirit in the form of a giant bird. It is believed that the name of this powerful being that was transferred to him cured him. After the ceremony and spiritual experience, Morriso accepted his calling as a shaman, not as a traditional midwin, but he saw himself as an artist shaman. He believed that he was chosen to do art to heal his people. His paintings express his dreams and visions, stories, as well as his transformational experiences. Artist and Shaman Between Two Worlds depicts the coming together of two spiritual realms the upper world inhabited by the thunderbird and the underworld of the serpent. This painting suggests that artists and shamans have the ability to inhabit and move in between these two worlds. The six-panel masterpiece, Man Changing into Thunderbird, records Morisot's shifting vision of spirituality and his personal growth as an artist. It also charts his personal transformation into Cooper um, Thunderbird, the spirit name he received in this healing ceremony, and also his signature that he used in Cree syllabics. He also publicly performed the role of shaman. Once he organized a tea party to which he invited a group of art collectors, art critics and journalists, and he incorporated in that party some ceremonial practices such as smudging, which is a purification ceremony to cleanse the body, mind and spirit of negative energies, emotions. And it involves the use of smoke from burning sage, sweetgrass, cedar or other herbs. 
But most importantly, his role as a shaman was visible directly in his art. Asked about his artistic choices and process, he responded, I don't think about all these things. I know about all these things. Which points to the shamanic practice of acquiring knowledge through visions, dreams and stories. Spending time with his grandfather, who was a Midewin, he saw these, those sac sacred symbols drawn on birch barks that are used in sacred ceremonies and decided to incorporate them in his paintings. Anishinaabe believe that, that those symbols are charged with energies, so he believed that those symbols had healing properties. He mentioned how some of his clients would come back to him and say, you healed me, and he would reply, no, the painting did. Initially, Morisot was st strongly criticized by his own society for using sacred knowledge in his art. However, he was set on a revolutionary path and ultimately became a leader of contemporary indigenous art. His unique style was an inspiration to several indigenous artists such as Daphne Oje, Carl Ray, Blake de Basic, and Saul Williams. Morisot was appointed the Royal Canadian Academy of Art in 1973 and presented with the Order of Canada in 1978. When we look at his paintings, several elements point to spirituality and shamanic belief. The wavy lines point to ceremonial power energies. Large eyes that see everything is a symbol of a shaman or a medicine man. They also relate to the X-ray style attributed to Morisot. The technique shows the interior as well as the exterior of a figure. The various parts of a body, for example, are expressed uh, through different colors and lines, providing an all-encompassing knowledge or vision. The concept of transformation that is central to shamanic Practices and in Morisot's art is not only part of their spiritual beliefs, it is a reflection of the values of kinship and relationality, which are also celebrated and honored in Morisot's art. Morisot honored all his relations, wife and his children, his extended family. His paintings that are deeply embedded in indigenous stories demonstrate that the concept of relatives, kinship, goes beyond human, it is also non-human, that we are all related, connected in a reciprocal, responsible way with all the beings, plants, animals, birds, water beings, are seen in the lines connecting beings in his paintings. They refer to relationality and communication as well as transformation. Morisot, as a shaman artist, was a strong advocate of indigenous epistemologies, and this was particularly demonstrated in this mural design for the Indians of Canada Pavilion at Expo 67. The mural, titled Earth Mother with Her Children, depicted a being with long, white hair with exposed breasts, along with a bear cub and a human child. In his original concept, the cup and child both were nursing at the Earth Mother's breast. However, the government censored his work because they considered the image too explicit and controversial. The final modified design created a greater distance between the Earth Mother's breast and the human child and her animal child, disrespecting the indigenous beliefs and disconnecting the relation between all beings. Morisot subsequently left this project, which was completed by his assistant Carl Ray. And through this act of leaving the project, Morisot performed a protest against the government's interference in his artistic expressions and disrespecting his traditional beliefs. The second artist I would like to refer to is Kina Rees, a Vancouver-based multidisciplinary performance artist of Simpson, Gitxan, Meti and Cree origin. She molds spoken word, humor, writing, singing, visual and video art in voicing her feelings and statements on issues concerning her native multicultural community.
with a focus on settler colonialism and its consequences on indigenous peoples, especially women and children. The characteristic feature of her work is the trickster and the sacred clown that she has taken on as her artistic identity and role. To indigenous nations in Canada, Raven or the Coyote is, I quote, the original organizer, trickster, transformer, teacher, catalyst and chief spirit. He's also a relentless schemer and a practical joker, lustful, impulsive, cunning, shameless and without remorse. Raven also occasionally appears in examples of shamanic art as he originally gave the secrets of shamanism to the people, unquote. Shearer also shares that Coyote is another trickster figure, but from the plains and southwest regions in Canada. The sacred clown, ceremonial figure that appears in rituals of Lakota, Dakota and Hopi nations, is a confusing individual who has no boundaries, innocent and wise, represents a reversal of the normal order, and through jokes, pranks and mischiefs, asks questions or pushes people to search for answers to those questions, is a teacher and one who prepares people to face the reality, the truth or any catastrophe, moment of disorder, sickness, death and to heal. This is what makes her work intentionally provocative and shocking. She intends to make her audience unsettled, uncomfortable, to push them into questions, discussions, to acknowledge the colonial mistreatment of her people, but also to celebrate her people's culture and values. In Shaman Nurse, performed at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian in 2008, with mostly Euro-Canadians dominated in the audience, colonization itself was the main topic. She found it challenging to perform in a place that stores sacred artifacts and regalia. She said, I quote, It wasn't easy for me to do. It's not easy for me to be at the Smithsonian. It's not easy for me to see my artifacts in this space. It's not easy to digest that most of the stuff here is stolen. I didn't want to make it easy to hear what I want to say, unquote. Her performance was carried on as follows. Reese lies on a black sheet table while a white male artist places a small bucket of red paint between her splayed legs. He paints one of the Columbus's ships on a large board as Reese speaks about sexual fetishes, fears of government and the inaccurate portrayal of Indians on television. Skeena explained that this was a metaphor illustrating the colonists painting their own history of native people with the blood taken from the people she defines as her community. The placing of the red paintful bucket between her spread legs point to sexual harassment and physical and mental abuse of indigenous women and men that accompanied colonization. The Reese does not directly involve or recall any spirits as the shamans in traditional performances do. She is pre primarily interested in the same aim, which is to establish social order and peace. Some people find her work reactionary. However, she explains, I quote, I feel like being angry by simply being angry is a continuance of the genocide of our people that we have taken upon that hate and self-hate and continue with the role of colonists was to do for us, to kill our spirit. I'm trying to transcend that, to become more of an observer of what is happening, to be more objective and less reactionary." Unquote. Reese identifies her performance as shamanistic and she explains, I quote, I almost create ceremonies through the words that I use, through the instruments that I employ in my work, and through the things or the thoughts that I am trying to convey to the people, and how I use the people as part of the performances themselves, unquote. For the Northwest Coast Nation's potlatch ceremony, for instance, the audience is inevitable to publicly display one's wealth, privilege and get the acknowledgement. So is the audience vital for Reese's performance. 
the utmost role of her art is communication. And she says that it is not enough to make art for the sake of art. Her artistic intention is to make meaning and have her message understood and accepted. So she is also aware of the responsibility that she holds to her audience. Critics find, I quote, her creative process has community building, care and healing at its very center, but also her own self-care folded within her art making, unquote. Her methodology is ingrained in indigenous ways of knowing and holistic philosophies, where the human being is only a small part of a larger whole. She understands her role as an artist, as one who records, inspires, teaches, sustains, and is very much part of the culture and community. Two of her more recent performances are in itself ceremonial acts of caring and reconciliation, highlighting the values of respect, reciprocity, healing. She made an adult-sized moss bag that is generally meant to carry babies. If they are made of hide or cloth with actual moss placed inside the bag to absorb body fluid. They symbolize the protection, wrapping, adoring care that families and communities give to their new members. And they are also a reminder that we always need care in our lives. Skeena comments, I quote, the bag is a place to rest for a moment, evoking a feeling of longing, not a feeling of loss. Being wrapped gives a calming feeling that elicits hope for the future and is a way to hold people up. Unquote. The, bags, uh, the bag was exhibited first uh, at the exhibition, the time it takes, but later in 2019 she turned it into a series of live performances by ceremonially activating this moss bag. She wrapped 12 elders who she respected. One of them was her mother Cleo at Belkin Gallery in 2019. This performance was a gesture and an act of love, protection, respect, gratitude and honouring elders. The final example, the video Touch Me, was presented at 2013 um, at an exhibition called Witnesses, Art and Canada's Indian Residential Schools at the Morris and Helen Belkin Art Gallery. During the 14-minute long video, we see Rees bathing Ukrainian-Canadian artist Sandra Semchuk. Skina reminisces, I quote, The opening scene is a dark room with a well-lit tub. Sandra Semchuk and I approach the tub. I extend my hand to help her get into it. The cameras are set wide and a second cameraman follows our movements closely. Without speaking, I bathe her gently, her hands, her face, and pour water over her with a small copper pot. We do this for several minutes and eventually break our silence with a short dialogue where we shed some tears. My bathing Sandra is a gesture of care, showing the ability to love, to respect, and take care of others. From one generation to another, junior artist to senior artist, and a native woman to white woman. My response to this painful history is to share the continued ability to show reverence, respect, care, and love. Not despite our colonial history, but as a continuation of this strength that has been passed on since time immemorial. Speaking to my people, I'm saying that these abilities are not lost on me. Speaking to others, I'm saying, this is our resilience, unquote. This film was a response to the intergenerational legacy of the Indian residential school system in Canada. It was influenced by Skina's personal experience, the disconnected, distant relationship with her family, with her parents, lack of intimacy and trust. Her parents were both second generation residential school survivors. The film was meant to be a ceremonial healing gesture, an act of reconnection between mother and daughter, child and elder, undertaken through touch, intimacy, nurturing and loving act of 
bathing an elder. Skina wrote later about a cathartic healing experience, I quote, I can't know why each person in the audience cried. Everybody had their own reasons to cry. This was a lesson. The challenge for those in the audience was to find peace within it all. I have found peace and I am healing. I gave survivors license to find peace, hopefully, and it gave white people a chance to grieve." Unquote. So whether it is soothing or shocking, as a contemporary shaman and sacred clown, Skina's aim is to cure, to heal the emotions or the situation, either by giving relief or by making people aware of certain problems. She identifies her style as sweet grass and honey. Honey as the sweetener used in coffee and tea and sweet grass is a medicinal plant used as part of ceremonies to smudge and purify the negative energies and to move prayers from minds and bodies up to the great spirit. She has been also called by critics as a comedic goddess matriarch. So sweet grass honey and comedy goddess matriarch, these two descriptions best conclude Skina Reese's work. So indigenous artists who strongly draw from their own traditions and knowledge, these shaman artists are message givers, eye openers and visionaries who make art to make meaning, to make their performance and art efficacious, purposeful, Sincere and with a straightforward approach and deeply engaging people's bodies, minds, they try to bring change, to heal themselves, to heal people, to heal the world. While they address their own reactions to the colonial history of Canada, they also celebrate their own indigenous cultures and philosophies, sharing ideas and values that are grounded in holistic, ecocentric, and kin-centric worldviews that honor and guard the key indigenous values or the four R's, respect, reciprocity, relationship, and responsibility, that if paid careful attention, may offer insights for the contemporary world plunged in a complex crisis of spirituality, in the uncertain times of wars, pandemics, an ecological and economic crisis. And ultimately, they may push to reconsider our relationships with society and nature and together act toward a sustainable future. Thank you for your attention.